Hey guys, we are back again with Sweet Robin's fan fiction project. The Ariel Hota chapter, The Princess Justice, was received pretty well. People seem to have liked it even better than Daenerys, with some even saying that they liked it more than The Captain of the Guard or The Watcher, which is a pretty big compliment. By the way, it's kind of weird that nearly every artistic portrayal of Hota has him with a beard when Narvashi are forbidden from having beards. I mean, yes, this lore was added with the world of ice and fire, but kudos to Game of Thrones and Omar88. Anyway, thank you again to everyone who contributed on Ario Hota, as well as the editors, fantastic work, and the readers. I myself can't wait to get back to Hota's story. His next chapter will likely be called The Emissary, which would take place at High Hermitage, and would likely involve him treating with Darkstar, but we won't get to that for a bit. I wanted to get the next chapter request out there because it's a bit more challenging. It's the prologue. So this chapter is going to be a bit longer, though The Prince's Justice actually did come out pretty long. That chapter was near 7,000 words, but for the prologue we want it to be somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 words. And let's try to get the submissions in by June 9th. So the prologue will take place at the Crag in the Westerlands, and will be from the point of view of a maester. And the general reason for the maester point of view is because the second and fourth books were from a maester perspective, Maester Crescent and Pate the Acolyte, so it seems we should continue this pattern. Additionally, George R. Martin said that Jane Westerling would appear in the prologue, so the setting being the crag makes sense. Now I know that there's a fan idea that the prologue would take place centering around Forley Prester's transportation of prisoners back to the Westerlands, but the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons takes place well after Prester left, and there's no mention of anything bad happening to them, so we have to assume that prisoners were delivered to Casterly Rock and the Crag with no issue. Now, who is the POV? I think it would be interesting and maybe a bit funny for the prologue to be from the perspective of Maester John, originally from House Vance. Now, I don't have that much attachment to it being Maester John, but he's one of the few maesters listed in an appendix that we know nothing about, and he's about the right age for a new maester out of the Citadel. He's the youngest of five brothers, the eldest who were friends with Edmure, so John could be in his mid-twenties or so. House Vance is also pretty malleable when it comes to allegiances. They supported Rob, but none of Maester John's brothers or father died in war, and they're brought back into the King's Peace pretty easily. Again, not attached to Maester John, so if you have a better idea on who the Maester should be, please go with it. So, Maester John's story is that he is a relatively new graduate of the Citadel, and has recently arrived at the Crag to be the maester for the newly elevated Lord Rolf Spicer of Castamir. This means that there will be another maester at the Crag, the Westerling Maester, who is likely much more knowledgeable of politics and the situation on the ground. The second maester, keep in mind, was near Rob Stark and Jane Westerling when they got together, so he likely does have some stories about what went down. In A Storm of Swords, Catelyn mentions that the Crag Maester should be caring for Rob, but Rob instead was in Jane Westerling's bed. So yeah, it's all a bit suspicious. Was he complicit in nefarious plans? Probably. I have no existing character on who this Maester should be, so as a placeholder, I'm just going to call him Maester Amory. But back to Maester John. So John has no interest in being a maester in the field, and certainly does not want to be a maester during the restoration of Castmere, where he will likely spend months during winter in tents or poorly insulated rooms, overseeing the restoration of the keep, and trekking out to mines to see if they can be salvaged and drained. This is not a life for him. What he wants is to return to warmer Old Town at the Citadel, with like-minded researchers, where he can again see a man he is infatuated with, named Aleros. His big plan to get back to Old Town is that he thinks he's on the brink of figuring out why the seasons are out of whack. When he presents his evidence to the Citadel, they will insist that he return to the Conclave to further his research there. Now on this, I personally don't have a good explanation on why the seasons are screwed up. If you do, besides it just being magic, please try to include it. But if you don't have an idea like me, you can write around the explanation. Perhaps you can vaguely talk about John's research regarding the movement of the stars and planets, the length of the day, the comet, werewood biology, atmospheric measurements using Quicksilver, whatever you like. Keep in mind, the maester doesn't have to be right, he just has to think he is. So there's a bit to cover in the chapter. I see it roughly working like Crescent's prologue, with John having conversations with characters and giving backstory in his head. 
His motivation to move from place to place, meeting different people, could be that he has to check on his experiments, or perhaps he has to deliver raven messages, or he has to do something for Rolf Spicer and his move, or perhaps he has to deliver medicine. There's a lot of reasons for a maester to be running around. I see the climax of the chapter being him examining a scientific reading of some sort, and him being sure he's figured out why the seasons are screwed up, and then, you know, tragedy of the ending killing him. So like the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons, I think it should be the first day of winter with a white raven arriving. And with this, we have the opportunity for Maester John to explain the difference between white and black ravens. I think the best explanation is that white ravens not only can talk, but have a secret language of pecking and foot movements that communicate top secret messages from the Archmaesters. We don't necessarily have to reveal what the secret message is that the White Raven carries, only that there is in fact a message. Now with the White Raven, John also has the opportunity to think about Archmaester Walgrave and the possible Southern Ambition Conspiracy. This is the idea that some maesters wanted to get rid of the Targaryens by uniting the great houses in marriage, namely Stark, Tully, Baratheon, and Aaron. Lady Dustin accuses the old Winterfell maester, Maester Wallis, of being in on this conspiracy, and the name similarity makes fans think that Wallis is Walgrave's son, and that perhaps Maester Cresson was in on the plan too. Maester John could vaguely know about this plan, and the White Raven could perhaps be bringing news about Daenerys. I actually don't think Maester Amory would be a part of the conspiracy, as he seems to have been in on destroying Robb Stark. On top of this, because the White Ravens are all kept together, I think it may be interesting to have the birds say something vocally like, John, beware Marsh, showing that Sam was watching the wall with a glass candle and perhaps tried to warn Jon Snow of a coup with a White Raven, but failed. The Ravens do mimic each other. And of course, Maester John would be confused as his name is also John and might think that Aleros is trying to talk to him or something. Now, with regards to Maester John's relationship with Aleros, at some point, we need John to think back to his time at the Citadel. Essentially, John greatly respected Aleros and believed him to be a handsome man, but then after a drunken evening at the Quill and Tankard, they had a romantic incident. Probably something like them making out and Aleros giving him a hand job in an alley. What is important is that Maester John has absolutely no idea that Aleros is Sorella Sand and actually a woman. Additionally, this is likely only a hookup for Sorella Sand, and she does not have feelings for John. John was leaving for the crag, so this was a little mischief that she could have with no strings. John is clueless, though, and believes he has some huge connection with Aleros. What also needs to happen is that a House Westerling ship called Bravo, Danny saw this ship in Carth, is in port, having snuck past the Ironborn. It is unloading a fortune in silk and spices from the Jade Sea. House Westerling and House Spicer have essentially saved themselves from poverty. They have the money to restore Castamere, dewater the mines, buy more ships, and become great houses. Now, regarding Bravo being back from Karth and the Jade Sea, this is an opportunity to talk about House Spicer's connection to Essos, specifically Karth. As Daenerys will be heading to Karth next, this is a chance to talk about the ancient guild of Spicers, Perhaps how Spicer was once a member of the guild, and now they hope to bring regular Carthine trade to the crag. And since we're talking about how Spicer's history, feel free to talk about Maggie the Frog. However, there is tension within House Westerling. While Lord Gowan Westerling and Sybil Spicer are keen on rebuilding Houses Westerling and Spicer, Jane Westerling is furious that her parents are cooperating with the Lannisters. She is also angry that she is now betrothed to Sir Tybolt Krakal, as she will never love again after Rob. Jane's betrothal, by the way, is the Lannisters making good on their promise to Sybil, an heir for Jane. Jane's younger sister Elena is also due a betrothal to an heir, so include one if you have a good one in mind. I chose Tybolt Krakal for Jane, as the Krakals in the future are going to be tied to the phrase of Derry, where Oliver Frey, Rob's first squire, is hanging out. Now what's important here is that while Jane Westerling fights with her parents, she's still very well liked by her little brother Rollum Westerling. Rollum was Rob's squire and adored him. The heir to House Westerling is Reynold Westerling, the Knight of Seashells, but he is missing after the Red Wedding and presumed dead. Everyone should still be mourning him, but this also means that Rollum is the heir to the Crag, and perhaps Castamere as well, and all that wealth that just came in on the Jade Sea. Essentially, the chapter should look like there might be a violent confrontation between Jane and her parents, but this is a fake-out. Something else is going to kill Maester John. And I'd like to keep that a secret. 
Just end your submission with Maester John heading to see Lord Gawain and Lady Sybil. I know this makes writing a little difficult, so if you must know for your writing, you can email me and I will tell you. Again, nothing is really written in stone here, so if you have any other ideas on what should be in the prologue, please include them, and I look forward to your submissions. Thanks for everything.